Um, well, that's that's just a little bit about me. Um, this this talk was prepared when the, the time estimates were a little bit longer, so I'm trying to rattle through it. I shouldn't uh, run over, I, I hope. That's just a little bit about me, and that's the title of of the uh, uh, of what I'm going to be talking about: uh, cultural expertise and the Equality Act in the UK. Some thoughts from a judge as to the present and future for cultural expertise in the law. Uh, now uh, I'm just going to. Um, get rid of my screen share. Hopefully you've seen that slide. Stop share, there we go. So um, hopefully you can uh, see me now. Um, sorry to be reading from a script, but this was prepared for translation purposes. Um, it's good to be here, at least in Paris. Uh, it's uh, a pity we're not physically in the Sorbonne. I'm just across the way from, from the building. And it's good to see that the project has gone from strength to strength and uh, that uh, the, the outputs have, have come to this fruition. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about myself before getting into what it is I'm going to say. I'm a, a judge in England and I sit in the civil part uh, of the High Court in London, which is part of what we call the Senior Courts. It used to be called the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm a judge in the King's Bench Division, which is uh, an area of the courts, a division of the court that deals with quite a wide range of civil work such as serious road accidents, very, very serious brain injuries, paralysis, death, uh, non-recent child abuse cases. We saw quite a lot of those. Uh, libel, slander, human rights, modern slavery, uh, people trafficking, that sort of thing. So quite a wide, as well as contract law. Uh, so quite a wide range of, of work. Um, but whilst I'm a judge for a living, I also do a bit of academic work and uh, Livia kindly invited me to um, be part of this project um, and strictly I'm the advisory head of interdisciplinary collaboration a Euro expert now in terms of my outlook what I bring to this discussion is is really more the practical everyday court experience uh, where you might at any time encounter the necessity for what one might broadly call cultural expertise um, and where the judge has to navigate their way to trying to achieve justice, which recognises that the laws and legal processes contain latent cultural values or assumptions, which are often historically derived, of course, from empire or religion or colonialization, and certainly uh, which originate historically from a particular perspective, uh, namely that of the white English European legal system. And it's only really relatively recently that uh, with projects such as Euro Expert, there's been the opening of a serious and crucially practical approach to uh, recognising and attempting to address the potential injustice that can be caused by or heightened by uh, laws and legal processes and practices which neglect uh, cultural considerations that are so often in play in real life situations. Uh, just a bit about the Equality Act in the UK. The Equality Act uh, legally gives protections to, uh, which are actionable in court, uh, to people uh, from discrimination in the workplace and in wider society, such as in goods and services. It was originally there really to implement European directives, among other things, as well as pre-existing British basic law. And it replaced and effectively combined and codified previous anti-discrimination laws that were spread across various statutes. Um, it provides basic a basic framework, if you like, of protection against discrimination, both direct and indirect, as well as harassment and victimization in relation to protected characteristics such as sex and race. And the public sector equality duty came into force in 2011, which means that public bodies in the UK have a positive duty to consider the protected characteristics of individuals when they carry out their day to day uh, functions. And of course, as long as the UK remains within the European Convention on Human Rights, which is, one can see, politically uncertain, uh, the courts, in addition, of course, as public bodies, are bound to apply Article 6 uh, and, in, in the case of trials, and of course, Article 14 in relation to uh, not discriminating. Uh, it's particularly topical to be talking about cultural expertise now, of course, because against the background of ongoing events in, in the United Kingdom, where I'm from, uh, we see uh, the rise of uh, what might be called ultra conservatism with a small c. Uh, only this week we had proposals from the UK's human rights body to roll back uh, discrimination protections against sex discrimination uh, 
role which the trans community have, have benefited for a couple of decades so that one would no longer be protected against sex discrimination. So the need for cultural expertise uh, is perhaps as important as it, as, as it ever was. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of illustrations from my actual work, my actual experience in court, in terms of what I mean by cultural expertise. Um, the in these examples um cultural expertise is it, 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 the illustration is really the most basic sense the use of actual expertise actual human experts on cultural expertise but i'm going to go a little bit wider than that but in these examples we've got uh, specific human experts giving evidence um but i'm going to suggest that the word cultural is inherently indicative of a broader sense of a set of uh, concepts and not limited to for example culture and its ethnic or international heritage sense, and that it can include cultures or uh, practices within other parts of societies. Um, so, for example, in a case that I encountered uh, relating to the Royal Navy in the UK, they had intercepted a ship off the coast of Somalia, uh, and people were arrested as suspected um, pirates under international law, and they were processed eventually by overseas legal authorities but in my particular instance a case arose where where someone uh, was arrested and detained and was treated as having criminal responsibility based on appearance and general behavior and maturity and was then subjected to prosecution but it emerged later that this was in fact a child only 11 years old uh, from a nomadic Somali family uh, and he was acquitted ultimately in the country where he was prosecuted of any criminal responsibility uh, he lacked capacity to commit crimes. He, he, he simply didn't have, he hadn't reached the age and maturity to, to understand what he was doing. But he had been treated as if he were an adult by the British authorities, and it, it resulted in a civil case. As to what the British authorities knew or ought to have known about the vulnerability of, of a child such as that, and, and the way that the, local, the British authorities had viewed the child through, through a particular cultural lens, a uh, sort of Western lens, uh, and uh, had interpreted the degree of maturity, apparent maturity of the child as indicative of adulthood. Uh, and in the case of culture expert, a country expert was instructed to advise on cultural practices in Somalia and what would be expected in terms of the level of maturity of a child of that age who had grown up in that environment. Uh, and in that context, therefore, what the British authorities ought to have known had they had sufficient expertise involved. Um, and indeed, later on, when the case had ended, there then arose a question of how to protect the child who had received or was going to receive compensation, because um, if it became known in the nomadic community in Somalia that a significant amount of money had been received, then that child might then be exploited by much the same gangs uh, who, who had actually um, uh, trafficked him effectively as, a, 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 as part of unlawful piracy. Uh, and we, again, had an expert there on um, the extent to which anonymity was required and what steps might be needed to prevent intercommunication and the information getting back so that that child would be exposed to risk on the ground. Um, second example, uh, is one I had just recently in my court. Um, those, of, those of us old enough will remember the Cold War and the Soviet Union. Well, I, last month I had a former KGB official, a KGB officer, and tail end of the Cold War, uh, he was placed in Latvia to infiltrate the security services there. And in due course, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, Cold War ended. Uh, and he had, in fact, by that time, defected to the UK and had a new identity, new address, new everything else. But Latvia, of course, moved on. The European Union came along. Latvia became a, a full EU country. And there are information sharing and security arrangements, of course, between Britain and Latvia and other EU states. And in the course of that, information about the real identity of the KGB defector was given to the Latvian authorities. Um, but, of course... Uh, that appears to have got back to Russia, and the allegation is that that has then exposed uh, this person, this uh, ex-spy, to risk that he might be assassinated, and indeed he has been receiving threats. It's been in the national press uh, at home, so it isn't secret, um, but 
the suggestion is that privacy arrangements have been breached, GDPR, for example. And um, we have in that case got a, 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 a what I say is a culture expert, but it's someone who's an expert on the culture within the KGB, what the practices are, uh, the likelihood that these are threats from that direction and that the style and the manner of approaching these sorts of things culturally within that organization. Um, and I, I view cultural expertise as, as, as in that sense somewhat wider than, than simply ethnicity or, or heritage. Um, and I, I highlight that in, you know, in that in that context, really. I have a three dimensional approach to uh, how we look at cultural expertise in the courts. Um, and this is really reflected in my chapter in the book, Livia's book, that literally, I think, only just came out yesterday through Routledge. Um, my chapter is on LGBTQ cultural expertise. Um, and even where LGBTQ people aren't recognized in law, uh, or rather where they are recognized in law, even in liberally minded jurisdictions, there's still a wide range of countervailing social concepts which are anti-LGBTQ, uh, as I say, even within tolerant jurisdictions. So the concept of culture can have positive and negative console, uh, connotations. It can be seen as a good or a bad thing, depending on the political stance of those involved. So a group uh, opposed to LGBTQ rights might see gay culture, in quotes, as, as undermining morality. Um, so these things are, are not uh, in, invariably seen as positive ones. Now, the three-factor model that I consider really in relation to judicial thinking about culture really has three limbs to it. Um, I'm just going to share my, my screen uh, again and uh, hopefully advance the slide to the next. There we go. I've got a, an illustration there. I see that really there are three sources, professional experts of the sort that I've just talked about, the personal and workplace experience of judges themselves as part of a diverse community in themselves. In other words, their inherent expertise as part of society. And then also, if you like, the gray area of the vicarious incorporation of expertise from informal sources and guidance. In other words, not black letter law, not binding law, but other sources of extrinsic information, which uh, can be taken into account by judges uh, and, and which I think form part of the the, the corpus of um, uh, of expertise. Now, um, I think I've dealt with cult professional cultural expertise briefly, and I'll need to press on because of uh, the pressure of time. But the second dimension here that I'll talk about is informal guidance, and we have something called the Equal Treatment Bench Book at home, which is a book put together by judges sharing what they think is best practice about cultural expertise and awareness in its broadest sense. And it isn't legally binding, um, but it is generally regarded as best practice. So I see that as a, a, as a second source of gray area incorporation of expertise, which derives from the corpus of, of knowledge within the judicial community itself. The third dimension, is the personal expertise of the judge. And this is where the importance of a diverse judiciary comes in, because if we have a diverse judiciary, then not only do their knowledge, does their knowledge spread into the rest of the judiciary to form perhaps part of the Equal Treatment Bench, but, but also um, it can inform the individual judge from their own personal experience. So I had a case called WFC and D, brackets minors, uh, which related to name changes for children in circumstances where the name change would reveal, uh, in all likelihood, based on stereotypical naming practices, a change of gender as well as a change of name. Uh, and it was routine to publish name changes, which of course would then go on the internet ultimately and be there permanently, which would mean that when the child grew up, their apparent change of gender would be permanently public and that conflicts I held with Article 8 of the Convention and also, in fact, with it, the express British law, which uh, maintains confidentiality. So I had to construe the statute so as to uh, exclude publication in those circumstances. Uh, and that was really a function of inherent cultural knowledge that I had because I'm a trans judge. Um, and I consulted with non-trans judges as part of the decision, but 
Um, it's an example, I think, of um, incorporating judicial experience and expertise um, into decisions in that way. So just to wrap up, um, looking to the future, I think that the work of Euro Expert and of course Caltech, um, which is one of the many outputs of Euro Expert, can start to form what I might describe as a type of fourth dimension. I've mentioned my three limbs, if you like, but if it in future proves possible to provide a significant digital tool that pools cultural expertise from all of those sources, all of those three sources, uh, we then ha almost have a hybrid fourth source, which can be there for all of us as lawyers, as anthropologists, as judges, so that we can share expertise, not just within our own jurisdictions, but across jurisdictions and across specialisms, then we have a great deal to learn from that project. And also we have the potential for what might be described as a uh, if you like a co-pilot or an assistant uh, for judges decision makers policy makers and others that can really integrate cultural expertise into governmental decisions policy making human rights work and uh, judicial work so i can foresee and i hope uh, that as this project moves to to a new phase that we can really start to move towards uh, a very significant digital tool which will make those sorts of sources of information uh, information very available to all of us um, thanks so much for inviting me. It's a shame I haven't been able to, to sort of meet you all. Thanks very much.